Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpy, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy, and we've got author and reporter Steve Drummond with us today. Steve, welcome to The Common Bridge. Hi, Rich. Thanks for having me. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. It's going to be about Harry Truman. Uh, Harry Truman said, an honest public servant can't become rich in politics. He can only attain greatness and satisfaction by service. And as you examine the life and the career of Harry Truman, you'll see he was a true public servant. And today we have the author of a book called The Watchdog. Uh, I'd recommend this book. It's uh, subtitled, How the Truman Committee Battled Corruption and Helped Win World War II. Very well researched. Um, and we have the author today, Steve Drummond. Welcome to the Common Bridge. I'm happy to have you here. Enjoyed the book. Um, Thank you. Let's tell the audience a little bit about you. Uh, you're with NPR. What do you do for the National Public Radio? Hi, Rich. Thanks. Yeah, I've been at NPR for about 20, well, it'll be 23 years in August. Um, I've done a lot of jobs there, but mostly I'm an editor. I'm, for the most part, a behind the scenes guy. I've, uh, my primary role right now is to edit our education coverage, but for the past five years, I worked on our podcast about race and identity called Code Switch. I was the executive producer. I've been the national editor. I was the um, editor uh, for a while of our afternoon program, All Things Considered. Uh, so a bit of a jack of all trades at NPR, and and I've, it's really been a rewarding career there since since the year 2000. What was the path that led you to NPR? What jobs did you have before and sure. where did you go to college and such? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm a three-time graduate of the University of Michigan. Um, uh, and after the last one, the, uh, two master's degrees in education and journalism, uh, education led me to newspapers. I worked in Tampa and St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, uh, and for a while down there, I had the notion of becoming a teacher. I went back to grad school. I, uh, I taught in my, I think, our own school district, Rich, the Wayne Westland Schools, as a substitute for a while. But I ended up uh, with a job at a newspaper called Education Week in Washington, covering education here in the early 90s. And after a few years of doing that, I kind of fell backwards into a job at NPR as the education editor. Um, after a lot of paths, kind of back where I'm uh, still doing that uh, now, it's sort of a much different form. Well, wonderful. We, it looks like we have a lot to talk about beyond uh, your most recent book. Um, you know, you're a bit of a historian, actually more than a bit of a historian. And uh, I know one of the people you mentioned, David McCullough, a yeah. uh, late David McCullough, great uh, historian, great writer. Um, he was an influence with you and perhaps others. Yeah, very much so. I, I should also say I worked all through college and graduate school, I worked at Greenfield Village and the Henry Ford Museum for years. I did all kinds of stuff there, and that sort of fueled, you know, sort of my childhood interest in history. So I've kind of always had a foot in this uh, world for a long time. David McCullough, of of course, a huge influence on me. He died while I was writing this book, which was kind of weird. I got an alert on my phone, and I looked down and said he had died, and I looked a little further down on the floor where his copy of the book on Truman was open to the section where I was, I happened to be writing about Truman's combat experience in World War One. It's not really a part of my book, but I had to kind of sketch over it. And, and his book and lots of others were kind of influential in that. Why, why was it important to write the book? The Watchdog. What what motivated you to do that? So um, I ran across the story a few years ago. I was writing a magazine article for uh, for the Wayne State Alumni Magazine, oddly, and I ran across these investigations that Senator Truman during the war was running. The United States in the 1940, as you know, was extremely unprepared for the war that lots of people knew was uh, coming. The U.S. Army at that time ranked 17th in the world behind Romania in size. Franklin Roosevelt and others knew the United States need to get ready real quick. 
and Detroit, as well as all the industrial parts of the country, would play a big role in this. But they had to turn the economy around and do it real fast from making cars and, and typewriters to making tanks and planes and boats and ships and all the things that we would need to fight. All that was great. But all this was being done in a hurry. It was costing billions of dollars. And there was a lot of room and potential for outright fraud and criminality, but also just lots of waste and mismanagement. And uh, Truman in early 1941 set out to look into this. And it's kind of, you know, for me reading, kind of going down an internet rabbit hole on this some years ago, it's kind of an inspiring story. What did he discover um, when he began looking at this massive number of contracts yep. that had been let out to government agencies and the private sector to try to yep. pivot to a war economy? Yep. In the macro scale, I'll talk about the big picture thing, and then I can talk about a couple of micro specific examples. But in a large way, you know how the government process works. Contractors bid on a project. The government looks at over their bids. They try and pick the lowest one, and they award the contract. 1940, 1941, there was no time for this. The government was cutting deals real fast. We needed tanks, 500 of them right now. And William Knudsen, working for Franklin Roosevelt, could pick up the phone and call the head of the Chrysler Corporation and in one deal, in one day, work out a deal to build five, to build a new factory to build 500 tanks, you know, uh, uh, you know, thousands of tanks eventually. Mm. So lots of money involved here. But Truman was very suspicious of these. It was called cost plus fixed fee. Instead of a bidding thing and picking the low bid, they would just say, how much do you think it's going to cost to build these tanks? And Chrysler would respond, X number of dollars. The government would say, okay. And then they would add in a, a certain amount for profits and say, okay, let's go with that. It was fast, but lots of potential for waste here. Truman was deeply suspicious of this. So this is just one of the many aspects. The other big thing was there were huge shortages of war materials, aluminum, steel, the government had to decide who was going to get steel. Would uh, the gunmaker Remington Arms get steel in, in, in New York State? Would a shipyard building a new battleship get the steel? Would shipyards out on the West Coast ver building tanker ships? There was a lot of questions of resource allocation and shortages. So in the big macro scale, Truman was looking into all of this stuff. And uh, I know that in the book you uh, zeroed in on some of the corruption yep. that was in the steel industry, that steel that was the foundation of armaments yep. wasn't being inspected and was being shipped out uh, with massive defects. Yep. Well, one of the coolest things was Truman early on when he started this committee, he went on the radio and he would say to regular Americans, hey, we need your help. If you see something wrong, if you see something going on down at the factory, you don't like something is wrong. Let us know. Write us a letter. And thousands of Americans over the course of the war did just that. They picked up a pen or a pencil or sat down at a typewriter and they wrote them a letter. I've seen lots of them, hundreds, thousands of them at the National Archives. Dear Senator Truman, hey, you should take a look at this. Or dear Senator Truman, thanks. Well, in one case, the committee staffers were getting letters from a guy at a steel plant in Pittsburgh. He was the inspection supervisor named George Dye. And he was saying, hey, this isn't cool. We're putting, we're sending bad steel out the door here. We're faking the inspection numbers. The letters are so dense and jargony and hard to understand that the staffers on the committee kind of blew them off at first. They were like, eh, I, this guy's a, they, they called it the crackpot file and they put him in the <laughs> crackpot file. But eventually it was discovered that a tanker ship had broken into one cold night in uh, Portland, Oregon. And all of a sudden they were like, uh oh. And so Truman sent three of his investigators, um, one of them, a 22-year-old guy right out of U Michigan Law School, up to, and they kind of went undercover in the plant. They said, hey, um, you guys are doing a great job up here. Can we get a tour around? And as they went around, they were like, well, how do you inspect all this deal? And pretty much led to uh, an investigation that revealed that this factory, whenever they steal didn't meet the standards or they didn't have the right inspection number, they would just fake it, send it out the door. So oh who knew what was going on in these ships or m vehicles or materials, where the steel was going, whether it was up to speed or not. And boy, did that make headlines around the country. And there were issues with uh, the army camps that they were building. I know Fort Leonard Wood, yes. uh, one of the major bases in Missouri. Yeah, this is problems. Exactly, Rich. This is how Truman got started on the whole thing in the first place. He sort, shortly after his reelection bid in 1940, narrowly won a second term in the Senate. Truman was getting letters from people in Missouri saying, hey, they're, they're building an army camp out here, Fort Leonard Wood, it's called. 
something's wrong going on here. Nobody's doing any work. You know, these guys are making a lot of money doing nothing. And Truman, this is why Truman is a lot of fun. He didn't send a staffer out there. He didn't, you know, create a big congressional delegation. Truman got in his car in Washington, D.C. one morning in January 1943, and he drove out there himself straight to Missouri. He starts wandering around this army camp asking questions, not making a big deal, just a guy in a suit. And he, what he sees makes him extremely angry. Piles of lumber sitting out in the snow going to ruin, guys sitting around playing cards, contractors soaking the government for three, four times what they should be getting paid. And Truman came back and he went to a bunch of other army camps. He saw the same kind of thing. He came to, back to Washington hopping mad. And that's when he went on the floor of the Senate and says, hey, we should be investigating this stuff. And that's when they formed the committee that became known as the Truman Committee. Very much so. And that was, you know, it was a teeny tiny appropriation. I just say Truman was a Democratic senator working in the administration. You know, he was a, a loyal soldier to his president, Franklin Roosevelt, a president of his own party. Roosevelt, and most other Democratic leaders were not at all crazy about this idea of an investigation that would look into whether they were doing a good job or not. But it quickly became clear if, if a Democrat didn't do it, the Republicans were ready to go. They would happily investigate the war effort. So it was a kind of a way, giving Truman his committee was kind of a way of taking the pressure off Roosevelt a bit. Yeah. The um, uh, other things that were very interesting on in the book were you know, planes that didn't perform. And, you know, how people could, in good conscience, say, sending young uh, airmen up in airplanes that didn't fly, that leaked gas, um, uh, landing craft, which uh, I want to talk a bit about as well. Yeah. And and Truman's also had some frustrations uh, about the contracts being let, um, that it was all big business and predominantly white owned that were getting the defense contracts versus you know, get putting something in there for the the little guy and the racial minorities. Very, uh, very, very much so. Truman uh, had had been a small businessman. He had been at a farm. He had been a farmer, as you know. He's the last president who did not have a college degree. Truman was a, a blue collar guy, and um, when he saw these defense contracts going to mostly large corporations in a certain part of the country, in the kind of the Rust Belt, we call it, or in the industrial Northeast. Truman was very upset. He, he was getting a lot of letters from small business owners around the country saying, hey, you know, we, we can help out, too. So he was very angry um, about that. And, and one of the primary goals he brought to the Truman Committee was trying to spread this out a little bit and move it away from these giant, uh, giant corporations, U.S. Steel, General Motors, Ford, all of whom made great contributions to the war effort. We shouldn't imply that they didn't. But he, his point was that there were lots of other companies that could help out and that all of this money and all of these jobs could go to other places in the country as well. It, it's really interesting because that's the way the system was designed with the government representing the people, uh, keeping an eye on the private sector uh, to get all the innovation and efficiencies from the uh, private sector, uh, but to, to not let them abuse rights or to not let them not perform and, you know, look at, kind of the the inner uh, twining now that we have uh, between our federal government and the biggest companies on the planet. Um, and you, you just wonder, like, who's speaking for the general public these days? Um, better times. Yes. Um, when you were researching the, the book, what did you expect to find in terms of the issues with the function of the outputs and the, the cost? And what surprised you the most that you said, oh, I never thought I was going to find this. There are a lot of parallels, as you know, today. We've read for most of our lives about the $200 toilet seat or whatever coming out of the Pentagon. They're always going to be this opportunity to make money off of a government contract. What impressed me and what surprised me most with the Truman Committee were a couple of things. One, while Truman was chairman, he resigned as chairman of the committee in August 1944 when he was chosen to be um Franklin Roosevelt's running mate for for a fourth term. During his time as chairman, the committee put out 32 reports. Every single one of them was unanimous and bipartisan. That was an amazing, and it speaks both to Truman's leadership and, as you mentioned a minute ago, that it was a different time. But he worked really, really hard to build consensus so that when the Truman Committee put out a report, it wasn't seen as a partisan thing or somebody playing pol 
politics or somebody trying to grab headlines. It was viewed by the media and by the public um, as something they could trust. So that was very surprising to me. The other thing I found, you know, as a guy who is a journalist in Washington today, seeing the toxic nature and the partisanship and the distrust that people have for the government and sometimes the contempt that people in the government have for the people, the way American everyday Americans responded to the Truman Committee. So many times they'd pick up a letter. I've read so many of them in the archive. Dear Senator Truman, I've got a son overseas fighting right now. And how dare this steel company be making profits on that? You know, you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. You know, thank you for this. That was really, really inspiring. And again, it just struck me as being very different than the atmosphere we work in today. And if I understood the book correctly, that they acknowledged the letters. If oh, yeah. somebody was reporting a problem that they wrote back and, yep. you know, and that was, you know, prior to computers that someone had to sit down and a stenographer had to record it and type it out and, yep. and post it. Um, so a government responsive to the electorate. Um, I just want to let that sink in yeah. for a moment and, and, and think about that. And one of the other things I thought was really interesting is that the, Navy wanting to bring in the amphibious vehicles versus a private company in Louisiana that was building them uh, and that ultimately were used to transport infantry and tanks into the D-Day invasion. Sure. Um, tell us about that. That is yep. a really interesting yep. uh, part of the book. Um, it was a, it was one of the most, a, a thing that I didn't know about, or I was unaware of this story completely when I got into it. But we've all seen the movie Saving Private Ryan or so many times over the years, soldiers going, uh, soldiers or Marines going ashore on D-Day or on some island in the Pacific. They're in these little boats. They, that, you know, I mean, it was a, let me just back up a second. It was a big giant question in World War II with, occupied Europe or Pacific Island, they, they couldn't just sail a boat into the port and have the sh sailors and the uh, soldiers climb off of it. They had a, the challenge was we're going to transport thousands of men on ships to a foreign, to an hostile territory. We're going to unload them from them ships and get them to the beach. How are we going to get them to the beach? There was no such thing to do to do that. So there was a lot of experimentation inventing of what we, these were called landing craft. The Navy, as you mentioned, had its own design that it developed in the late 1930s that everybody except the people in the Navy seemed to know it was terrible. It couldn't um, uh, it was underpowered. It couldn't get over reefs. If you uh, the, the slightly larger one for tanks couldn't carry a heavy tank. And if the seas were choppy, it, it wasn't cutting the mustard. And yet somehow the Navy stuck with this design. There was an entrepreneur, a boat builder in New Orleans named Andrew Jackson Higgins. His, these boats came to be known as Higgins boats, who had a much better design. He kept trying. He couldn't get in the door of the Navy. They kept blowing him off, um, saying, no, we have our own design. They didn't, he was a bit of a brash. He was kind of a jerk sometimes, and um, they didn't like him. And so they kept dismissing him and his design. Finally, he reached out to Senator Truman. He said, you know, hey, help me out here. Truman came up with an idea and he said to the Navy, put a tank on this guy's boat and one of your boats and put them out in the water in the choppy waters and see what happens. This happened down off of Norfolk, Virginia and the waters down there. Higgins boat sailed its tank several miles, landed on the beach and then came back to circle around the Navy's design, which was at danger of sinking and foundering in the heavy seas mm. with a big tank on it. And so all of a sudden the Navy kind of realized the mistake or was forced to realize the mistake. These boats were called Higgins boats. Thousands of soldiers at D-Day went ashore in them. Dwight Eisenhower gave them credit for being, you know, one of the single inventions that made the D-Day landings a success. They were used throughout the Pacific War. It was, a, you know, it's a big success story of World War II, and Truman played a tiny part in making that happen. It's really an interesting story because we've all seen the uh, her heroism and the uh, carnage uh, of D-Day and, and heard from survivors uh, of those awful days. And what you don't hear is that, hey, the machines failed, uh, but the, you know, the enemy defenses were so strong right. and some you know, things didn't get into shore because of the uh, enemy fire. But think if the story was, well, half the landing craft uh, sank yes. and couldn't get to shore. So absent the design uh, by uh, Mr. Higgins, uh, 
And absent the work of the Truman Committee, uh, perhaps D-Day would not have been the Allied success uh, that it turned out to be. Very much um, so. And, and, and the bar- bipartisanship, I think, so interesting. And, and near the end of the book, the, the, the talks about the Alcan Highway um, that really kind of showed the limits of what bipartisan support could do, because that turned out to be kind of a boondoggle, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. And we've seen this many, many times since. Well, let me tell you what this this was. There was a, there was a thing called the Alcan Highway that was, I mean, early in World War II, Alaska suddenly became very, very important. It was kind of on the way to Japan, sort of. And uh, there were strategic concerns at that. And, and eventually the Japanese would invade and capture two islands out there. So there were a lot of concerns about Alaska. There was a plan to build a road called the Alcan Highway through Canada to get soldiers and equipment up to Alaska. And at a certain point, they realized, oh, we're going to need some oil to serve those things. The Navy was kind of ready to put oil on ships and take it up there, gasoline or oil. Somehow the Army came up with this very strange idea to build a pipeline from a remote area in Canada down to another remote area of Canada, and that was going to solve this oil problem. A lot of people are saying this is not a good idea. Standard Oil and others are saying this, this is not a great idea. This one general and the Army... Uh, kind of put his foot down. Nope, we're going to do this. A lot of money got invested. A lot. It, it very quickly became clear this was a boondoggle. It was wasting a lot of money. It was never going to produce as much oil as they said. Of course, sooner or later, the Truman Committee gets involved and they start investigating, holding hearings. But as happened in this case and many times since, the military kind of closed ranks um, shut her down. And they said, you know, we're not talking about this national security. This is a national security mm-hmm. interest. And they pretty much shut Truman out. And so the Truman committee very successfully made clear that this was a giant waste of money that didn't stop the military from wasting some $200 million of the taxpayers money, uh, on this thing, even during all the way up through past the end of the war, when they sold it off for scrap for a couple of million bucks and, and, you know, it, it, and it was Truman's realization that once the military chose to sort of claim it was a national security interest, they could shut out Congress, they could shut out the media and kind of do whatever they want. We've seen this many, many times in the years uh, since World War II, and this was an early example of that. And so it kind of, while, while the Truman Committee was hugely successful, this case kind of showed the limits of how far a congressional investigation could go. And, and when we look at the aftermath of that, that uh, you know, during the Reagan administration, uh, David Stockman, the Office of Management and Budget, said, we can't audit the Defense Department. We don't know if there's 10,000 or 10 million suppliers and everything's behind this cloak of national security. Um, of course, we've seen a lot of examples of that lately and including you know, some heavy um, censoring. And, and one of the quotes uh, that I believe is a good one, I've, I've tried to research as best as I can. Uh, President Truman said, I never would have agreed to the formulation of the Central Intelligence Agency back in 47 if I had known it would become the American Gestapo. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, you know, the, the uh, erosion of rights. And, and I think that speaks to Truman's pure patriotism. I mean, he was a politician. Um, in in this phase of his life, and he, he clearly was a, a Democrat. Um, and when things weren't going well um, with the Office of Production Management, um, and Truman's first report, which was going to be devastating, he gave it to President Roosevelt to FDR three days in advance. And when the uh, report was made public, FDR on the same day said, "Well, we're revamping all of that." And we're now changing to the War Production Board. So he didn't blindside his president, um, but, but he still managed to make sure that the uh, facts weren't buried so that our uh, war economy could continue to thrive to serve our military. Many times during the war, one of the things that made the Truman Committee success was Truman was willing to not have to get credit for everything. He didn't need the headlines. He didn't need his name on everything. And so many times he would defer to Roosevelt, give Roosevelt a quiet heads up. The job would get done. And Truman, he says in his memoirs, I didn't care who got the credit. I just want this thing to uh, happen. Also, he was generous with the fellow senators on the committee, the Republicans and the Democrats. He would let them issue, write the report. He would let them stand up in the Senate and uh, deliver the report. Truman 
Truman was well capable um, of letting someone else get the spotlight. Um, and as a result, he kind of got the respect of the media and the public. And so ended. I always say the Truman Committee set out to avoid press coverage and by doing that got an awful lot of it. And Truman somehow mm -hmm. came through gradually during the war, people saying, hey, this guy's, you know, kind of a square shooter, kind of honest. And slowly through these three year period, Truman went from these pretty much being an unknown nobody in early 1941 by 1943, or people are starting to look around saying, hey, who's going to be Roosevelt's next vice president? You know, maybe this guy Truman. And eventually that's what happened. And so it was kind of this gradual. It's fun while I'm researching, writing the book, fun to watch Truman learning on the job and kind of growing into this position where he becomes a national figure. And Steve, were, were there much differences with the political climate? Because, you know, People reflect and think, well, the World War II period, we were all united and 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 such, but there were conflicts and divisions then. We had labor unrest, racial tensions, uh, income issues, uh, partisan politics, and did, did it seem like Truman rose above this or he just knew how to play it better? A little bit of both. I think... It's funny, I've been talking to a lot of people since the book came out, and there's a powerful tendency that we all do to say, oh, that was a simpler time, you know, and, just, you know, there wasn't the social media and all the sort of things that make things uh, instantaneous news, constant TV pressure. There's a powerful tendency to say, oh, it was a simpler time. Well, it didn't seem that way at the time. And there were newspapers and there were leaks and there were political constituents. And, you know, Roosevelt, you know, certainly did not control the entire Democratic Party. There were giant disagreements within the party. And so, yeah, Truman had, you know, he had been kind of a nobody in his first six years in the Senate, but he had also sat and watched and learned and kind of paid attention to what was going on. And so gradually, and here in the Truman Committee, he made some mistakes. There were a couple of leaks. He overstepped in, in criticizing Roosevelt a couple of times. But gradually, he started to get the hang of this, of working his fellow colleagues in the Senate, working the media, working Franklin Roosevelt, working the American people, you know, basically, as you kind of, it goes back to him saying, not so that he could become president of the United States. He never, he didn't want that mm -hmm. at all. But so they, you know, so the, so the United States could win the war. So the soldiers had the best equipment, the best tanks or guns or whatever they needed to fight with. It, it's kind of a, again, I keep saying it sounds corny. It's kind of an inspiring story. No, it is. It's an honest guy doing honest work yeah. um, and not looking for um, a, a reward for himself, um, and yet at great cost to himself. He was often worked himself to exhaustion yes. and needed to go down to Arkansas for the hot springs and be rejuvenated. Um, a lot of time away from his wife and daughter, uh, but a you know selfless man uh, serving, which would be something we'd sure like to have back. And you know, when you, you think about it, like he named uh, a Republican, Harold Burton, to the Supreme Court. Um, can you imagine that today? <laughs> yeah. It yeah. just, uh, you know, people are trying to undermine the Supreme Court and uh, not respect the division uh, among the three branches of government and, and uh, you know, close down uh, any kind of debate, which is another, a Truman quote. Uh, he said, when even one American who has done nothing wrong is forced by fear to shut his mind and close his mouth, then all Americans are in peril. And I, I believe that that's true, um, that we're seeing this unfold with us today. And yet, our structure of our government is the same. It's been the same since 1770s. And the processes that we have with the uh, balance of powers among the three uh, branches uh, is the same. There is, there should be independent journalism, yet we have people that are afraid to speak their mind or ostracizing people for uh, their thoughts and beliefs. Yet no different in the 1940s run up to World War II and the conduct of the war, and indeed after the war. We're in the same yep. country. Very much all so. over again. Um, I see a lot in the book. Th this came up a lot. I mean, before Pearl Harbor, before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, 
there were a lot of people in the country that thought, you know, the United States had no business being in this war and no business spending all this money on tanks and planes and all this stuff. No business having a big, giant military that could get in trouble. Um, all that ended uh, on December 7th, 1941. But Truman and others had seen early on that it was going to be impossible. You know, the the terrible um, atrocities of Hitler and what the Japanese were doing mm -hmm. in China a lot of people knew the United States would end up in this war. And so, you know, there were these deep divisions in the country. It was, it's, it's not like it was some giant monolith that everybody was on board with all of this stuff. And it was a complicated, uh, controversial time of disagreements. And, and yeah, time and time again, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of reassuring to see the country sort of figure it out and work it out. And it leaves me hope. You know, when you see other times when the country has faced deep crises and worked through it, it kind of makes you hope we kind of get through this phase, too. In, in, indeed. And I just shudder to think about some of the characters that we have in the House and the Senate today uh, and how they would be behaving. Um, and, but looking through that historical lens, that the civilian uh, economy going to a war economy and some of the stats from your book, from 1940 to 1942, in 1940, the United States economy produced 3,611 military airplanes. Two years later, 48,000, and on a pace to make 65,000 a year. From 56,000 combat vehicles, uh, or they started making 56,000 combat vehicles, 670,000 machine guns, 181 million artillery shells, 10 billion, billion with a B, rounds of small ammunition. An amazing pivot. And then one of the other things I really enjoyed about your book, because it hasn't been covered very well, here was this ramp up to a war economy. All these contracts let out. Now the war is over. Yeah. The war economy now, how to change to a civilian economy? What would happen to a community that was building tanks and is no is told, hey, we don't need the tanks anymore? You know what? That's a very interesting piece of history. I don't believe I've ever read much about it. Tell us about that. Same thing. I found that really fascinating too. And everybody, you know, in my own interest, in my own reading, you think about, oh, we have to take a, a, a country that makes cars and, like I said, typewriters and and all and convert it to war economy. And that seemed it, what everybody realized that was easier than doing the reverse. By 1943, the, the war still had a couple years to go. Everybody realized we, we can make they, they'd make incredible numbers, tens of hundreds of thousands of airplanes or tanks or whatever. But everybody started to know once after D-Day, oh, it kind of became clear that the United States and its allies were going to win the war. There's still a lot of hard fighting. No, no, no um, understanding of that. But that if the United States kept right up making tanks right up to the end of the war, then, you know, what was the point of that? There would be a lot of tanks that would never, ever even see combat or any kind of war material. So even while the war was still going, they had to start thinking about how are we going to turn all this off? How are we going to put it back? And then the question was, which I found really fascinating, I found in a, a book I read, was a historian saying, and put it back to what? Before the war was the Great Depression, 25% unemployment at its worst, millions of people out of work. So what were they going back to? Um, and the the macro thing, like I mentioned, an example of tanks. Oh, uh, Chrysler made this big factory to make tank all over the country. Companies not only had to make new products, but they had to make new factories to build the products. So now the United States suddenly had a whole inventory of the best, most modern factories in the world. But weirdly, in a lot of cases, they were owned by the federal government. So should the government just give it away? Should they sell it? Who should get it? How is all this going to happen? How are we going to stop making airplane warplanes? And it was so incredibly complicated. And everybody realized by 1943 or so, this would be way harder than gearing up to war. And the danger was huge. If they goofed it up, 
the country could go back into the Great Depression, which, you know, Americans had suffered for 10 years with the, with depression and unemployment. So anyway, it was really complicated. It was, you know, it's a it's a kind of the ending part of the book. But yeah, I, th- I agree with you. I think it's a really fascinating. It'd be, it'd be really fun to learn more about that. And, and again, I'm going to, to recommend that everybody read The Watchdog, uh, because this is a topic that's not examined much. Um, I mean, we know the big picture that um, as the war ended um, here in America, as uh, Steve Drummond has said, that the only modern factories on the face of the planet, you know, Asia and uh, uh, Europe were in ruins. Um, our consumers had money in hand because they were working during the war years. But, you know, essential materials were, you know, rubber, uh, for example, were rationed. And so they couldn't spend what the earnings were. And uh, so they returned home and uh, made a lot of babies. And hence, we had the baby boomers. <laughs> and until around the early 1980s, uh, dominated the planet um, in, in every uh, economic measure. Um, and, and so here's Harry Truman now, who didn't aspire to become the vice president. Uh, but it, there was enough people that wanted the then vice president Harry Wallace to be removed from the ticket. Do you know why the the FDR wanted to make that change? Yep. And it, it was unclear whether it was Roosevelt or the Democratic leadership or both or some or the other. It was complicated. Truman, uh, sorry, Roosevelt, Frank famously was very reluctant to um, give up power. And um, he liked to control things. And it was one of his biggest strengths and weaknesses. But uh, Henry Wallace was the vice president. He had been secretary of agriculture. He was kind of a an intellectual, uh, a very deep thinker. But a lot of the rank and file Republic, uh, sorry, Democratic leaders felt like um, Wallace was a bit kind of off in the clouds, and he didn't really understand how actual politics work. He didn't know how to build a, uh, you know, so build a consensus, create local uh, leadership, you know, get out the votes, all of that stuff. Wallace was pretty much ignor- ignorant of that, and so. In 1943, as it became clear that Franklin Roosevelt would probably, hopefully for the Democrats, run for a, an unprecedented fourth term, there was kind of a, an attempt to shove Wallace off. R- Roosevelt didn't really care, was reluctant. Um, and so for about a year, there was this giant battle over who would be the vice president. And then all of that filtered too with the fact that Franklin Roosevelt by this time was a very sick man. Nobody really out in the country knew it very all. It was kind of an open secret in Washington, D.C. But the Democratic leadership was kind of realizing that whoever was going to be the vice president was very, very likely to become the president of the United States. And so into 1944, this jockeying continued. And gradually, Truman, with the um, success of his committee, slowly was kind of working his way up to the top. Truman didn't want it. His wife especially didn't want to be vice president. He thought it was a Truman and thought it was a kind of an empty job. Um, he didn't really seek it out. And finally, at the Chicago convention in 19, August 1944, Roosevelt got on the phone and basically told Truman to take it. And Truman did. And so that's that's how that ended up. So you think about the uh, parallels in history. So here's the Democratic Party with a um, uh, uh, an older, uh, very ill uh, president, a, a a vice president that the party didn't have any confidence in, and searching around for a new vice president going into what might be a difficult re-election period uh, during a time when the country's still in crisis. Uh, as a historian, I'm I'm sure <laughs> you can see the repeats <laughs> going on here. We've seen this movie. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, and and what's what we seem to be missing in today's scenario is the uh, people with the track record of running committees rooted in the facts, speaking clear truths, uh, being bipartisan. Uh, and again, it could, it's one individual's willingness to be. Uh, bipartisan or reach across the aisle, there has to be a hand extended from the other side as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, better people will prevail. Uh, But uh, President Truman or Harry Truman served as vice president for only 82 days before the sudden death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, And I think history will treat him kindly. I think 
uh, Mr. Truman was looked at as a good president, um, that he was also faced with one of the most difficult decisions, which also came from the committee, and that was the decision to drop the atomic bombs as he did. Um, and that was a secret that he kept when the committee was investigating. They said, don't look at uh, Tennessee, Washington. Uh, we've got something going there. We just don't want to talk about it. And he had the judgment to protect that secret. He did. The It was called the Manhattan Project, the project to build the, the atomic bomb, as you know. Probably the single, at that time, certainly the biggest single weapons program or defense spending program in the government history. And inevitably, several times, people were writing into Truman saying, hey, they're buying up all this land. They're wasting all this money around the country in uh, New Mexico and in uh, near Knoxville, Tennessee, and in Hanford, Washington. And, and inevitably, Truman would say, hey, we got to look into this. Well, sure enough, uh, Army Chief of Staff George Marshall shows up in Truman's office and basically said, back off. This is top secret. Keep your hands off. Don't touch it. Trust me on this. And Truman and Truman did. And so, you know, the the secret was for for the most part preserved. This would come back to haunt Truman. He he sort of knew the general outline that something was up, but suddenly, as president of the United States for you know three months, um, he had to make this profound decision to drop this and you know bomb on Japan. Um, I, I'm no expert on the decision around the the decision to build the bomb, but I think um, you know I think. For Truman, it was a fair. It wasn't a decision he agonized over a lot. I think it was a, a simpler decision for her, to, for him to um, drop this weapon and end the war quickly and save American lives. I don't think Truman gave it a lot more thought than that. Well, there's an essay that's a favorite of mine by a fellow named Paul Fussell, um, F U S S E L. Um, that might be an, like, another good book project for you. Um, and he wrote uh, a column, and this is not the exact title, but um, uh, um, I, Praise of the Atomic Bomb. And um, he had been a, a soldier and seen action in multiple theaters and was being prepared to go invade the Japanese homeland. And when they heard that the bomb had been dropped and he said, oh, my goodness, we're going to get to live to be old men because they viewed it as a suicide mission. They were, they, were, they were calmly going to go out there and do that assault. And, you know, I've, I've been to Hiroshima years ago. I've talked with uh, people that were in their teens then, and they were telling, and I don't know that they knew what they were telling us, but they were being told, kill as many Marines as you can, any way you can, sharpen sticks, you know, make yourself a weapon, et cetera. Um, that was not going to be an invasion without uh, cost that we couldn't even imagine. And, you know, I'm I, wondering what documentation there is um, about the president's decision to to use the nuclear bomb. Yeah, I'd very much like to read up on this more. I think it's, I, I don't know if there is the book out there or whatever, but it's, you know, it's it's got to be one of the central aspects of Truman's presidency and you know, and of the 20th century when you get that right down to it. And I'd really like to oh. know more about it and sort of poke into the decision and whether whether Truman even really had a choice, whether it was so far down the road or whether whether somebody could have put a stop to it. And if so, why? Anyway, it's really fascinating area of history. Indeed. My, my, my father was being trained in, in uh, naval aviation to hmm. uh, attack Japan hmm. wow. when they dropped when they dropped the uh, the bomb. Right. So um, he didn't have to go do that. <laughs> Steve, this has been a great talk. Uh, Same here. What didn't we cover today that maybe we should have been talking about? Um, You know, I, um, you frankly asked a lot of great questions. We hit, we hit so many of the things that really inspired me about the book. I just keep coming back to saying Truman is a lot of fun. Like I had a lot of fun writing this book and delving into it. We didn't really talk about the other thing is during all this time that we talked, Truman was trying to be a dad and be a good husband and raise a daughter. His daughter, Margaret was um, finishing up high school and going, going to college during this period. Uh, Truman loved his wife deeply. She did not, Bess Truman did not like Washington, D.C. She did not like the political life. She wanted to go back to Missouri and did every chance she get. Lucky for me, because throughout their marriage, 
Um, Truman, whenever they were away, almost every day wrote a letter to his wife, Bess. If he was traveling or if they were not in the same place, he wrote a letter to her. It makes it very, very pleasurable to cover this story, to write the story, because, you know, not only can I see in the newspaper that, oh, Truman was in Los Angeles on a trip on a certain day in 1942 or whatever, but you can tell what was in his mind that day and what he ate for breakfast and what he was thinking about because he wrote a letter to his wife. And he comes across as, you know, again, a decent and for the most part, inspiring guy. And and he was trying to juggle this, you know, his role in this great historical event that was going on. But he was also still trying to be a dad and husband. And I found that really moving and kind of another window into this guy. Indeed, in that, uh, you know, faith, family and then service. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, it's a great combination. And I know that, uh, you know, there are people that are trying to take us um, uh, away from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, another quote that I really like of uh, Harry Truman, uh, that, you know, he, as he worked with the political opposition and opposition within his own party, um, but he, he also understood the enormous power of the government and today the government and a big tech complex, um, as some uh, pundits have termed it, the censorship industrial complex, (laughs) And, and Truman said, quote, once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of opposition, it only has one way to go. And that's down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes a source of terror to all its citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. And and we've seen that in other countries. Very much. Um, during the, the the course of human history and we need to understand that it's up to us to make sure that we don't fall down that uh rabbit hole that trap um what's next for steve drummond that is a really good question um writing a book it turns out is a difficult thing i found out and took a lot of work and you know i have a day job and so i have a few ideas i wouldn't mind trying this again but this um this, you know, started as a germ of an idea several years ago, and then I kind of was poking around, spending a day here at the there at the National Archive, and then for about the last two years, kind of when I wasn't working my day job at NPR, I've been working on this. So I'm kind of enjoying talking to people like you and talking about the book and meeting a lot of really fun people, getting great questions, and then, yeah, maybe sometime around there, I'll try it again. I don't know. Well, we sure uh, enjoy reading that. Again, the book is called The Watchdog. Um, it is written by Steve Drummond. It's a great tale. It's a, uh, a really fun read. Um, I, I encourage everyone to oh. uh, get a copy and read this. Um, Steve, before we wrap up today, any closing thoughts for the listeners, readers, and viewers of The Common Bridge? Well, um, the, again, um, I, I'm struck by some of the things you said and saying, yeah, the country's going through a rough patch right now, but it was both inspiring and helpful to me to read and write about a period when we face some very serious challenges and the, and the nation and the United States came through successfully. And that to me is kind of a help as we, kind of, you know, as I both watch from the side and find myself covering as a journalist in Washington, what's going on right now saying, you know, hopefully we'll get through this. That's Sounds a little corny, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. And and writing this book people, helped. I I think I, I share that uh, that sentiment. I appreciate you saying that. We've been talking today to Steve Drummond of NPR and his book, The Watchdog, about the Truman Committee during World War II. And with our guest Steve Drummond, this is your host Rich Helpy signing off on the Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on the Common Bridge. Subscribe to the Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.